I don't know about you as you turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I don't know about you, but even before this COVID thing came to be, the last couple, two, three years or so, maybe a, maybe a little bit longer than that, it seems like some major changes have happened in this country. I don't know if you've noticed. And the, the, the pace by which things have changed seems to be so quick. And I don't think I'm saying anything too spectacular to say that our country seems to be much less united than it was at one time. We're very, and I, I use the word, it's not a word I made up, but it, we, we've become very tribal. We all are part of our own little groups, and everybody's fighting for the rights of their own little groups. And because of that, we seem more, we seem more separate than ever before. And one of the things that I think that our country has always had its struggles and difficulties like any society, but um, it just seems that we are more at odds than we've ever been before. And I'll be honest, I have gotten caught up wrongly in some ways, um, you know, talking so much about politics in, in my private time and on Facebook and things like that and uh, become very passionate about so many of things that are in our society and sort of contributing to this tribalism to where I am setting myself against so many people about things like politics and race and some other social things that, that have come up, even about COVID and masks and no masks and the truth coming out of this department or the truth coming out of that department. And again, I, don't, I know that I'm not the only one that has seen this kind of thing, but like I said, I think our country and, and perhaps even in our communities, even perhaps even in our Christian communities, there's a lot of um, separation that if it's not happening, it's threatening to cause division and separation amongst people. Is it just me or, or is this something that we've kind of noticed in our country? Um, and I was reminded of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where God's purpose in bringing us together in Christ is not to separate us, but rather to unite us. And in this atmosphere of division and distinction and separation and fighting and, and all of this, I thought, and it's, you know, I'm going through it myself, I'm reminded of God's great and sovereign plan rather than to, to divide, but to bring people together in Him. And so I, wanna, I want to I wanna invite you to join me in a journey of thought through the Scriptures um, to go over some things that we know that hopefully we can rejoice in that. But then also, after recognizing who we are and what God has done in us and through us and with us, how to move and how we can relate to our world around us. And so, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 um, I want to pray and then we'll uh, begin reading at verse 12. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you, Lord, opening up your word, and we pray, God, that as we dive into your word, that your spirit would speak to us, God. Lord, all those who, who teach in whatever format and whatever way that we teach your word, we are mere, merely your instrument, God. We don't, we haven't created this truth. We are not the source of this truth, Lord. And our, and our words, uh, our style, our volume uh, is not what makes these words true uh, or relevant. Your word is always relevant, God. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit would speak to each of us, would speak to our hearts, God, and that, Lord, what you want to communicate to your people would be clearly communicated, God. Uh, I pray for your people. 
I pray for me as, as the deliverer of these words that they would be, uh, again, what you want to communicate. And we pray that you'd be glorified and your people would be built up. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 12, the scripture says this, For as the body is one and has many members, but all are members of that one body, being many, uh, I'm sorry, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing? And if the whole were hearing... Where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one members, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Verse 22, no, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part, part which lacks it, that there should be no schism or division in the body, but that the members should all have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Praise the Lord. This is not a new passage. This is, this is something that many of us have heard uh, many, many times. And I read this passage and I begin here because I wanted to remind us that despite what is happening out in our world, despite what is happening on Instagram and Facebook and all of these other medias, uh, CNN and Fox News and all of these things that are looking to create their own little groups of people that believe the certain thing and fighting against that other side and calling them ridiculous and ignorant and all of these things, God created the body that those in him would be united. Can you say amen to that? Again, when you know strife, when you, uh, when you see division within a community, within a people, within a country, you long for that those groups to be united, that there would be peace, that there would be understanding, that there would be harmony. Our country stands in stark contrast to so many other countries throughout history because individual states came together to form a country united. And that was the idea. And so, but God, before the United States ever existed, created and fashioned, as the scripture says, the body for us to be united. And it's interesting that he uses the word body. Because as we understand the body and that we have individual parts of our body, but that makes one body, we understand that the individual parts of our body connected together communicate a permanence of the body. Can you say amen to that? If my hand did not, does not like, and I'm just kind of paraphrasing the scripture, if my hand doesn't like my leg, because it's too fat, right? It doesn't say, hey, man, you're, the leg is too fat, I'm out of here. It doesn't get to do that. It has to make adjustments with the fat leg that it's attached to, Right? Because that's how the body is fashioned. The body is fashioned with many parts, but there is a permanence to the body. It's not meant to be separated. And for those of you who have suffered any injury where a piece of your body has been removed, you understand that the parts of your body that get removed, there is a lack that the body suffers because of that removal. Because the body is not supposed to be made up of separate pieces unconnected, but rather individual pieces connected together. And God uses that picture 
to teach us about what the church is supposed to be. And I think we should think about that as we move forward together as a body. This permanence of a body exists with the church as a whole, right? Our brothers, you know, in this, you know, our, our brothers and sisters in this church are united with the brothers and sisters in China and other places. So this permanence deals with the church universal. But it also applies to the local church. Do we believe that God fashioned Calvary Chapel into the light with the individual members that it's made up of? Yes or no? I hear near silence. <laughs> Did God place you here to be part of this body or was it a random or, or was it simply because it's close to my house? I will tell you, just as God fashioned the body, as he says in the scripture that we read, God brought this church together and fashioned it through his will and through his power. And if you don't know that, this is what the Bible teaches. God fashioned the body and the members in it to be joined together. You were brought to this body for me and the rest of us. I have been brought to this body for you and the rest of the body. And so like a body, we understand that there is a permanence to our body. And what I mean by that is, is that God, in, God creates a body for it to stay together. Not for pieces just to go off and kind of do their own thing. And it's something that we need to really think about as we look at this passage in 1 Corinthians, as we make decisions about what God's will is for us as we attend the church that we attend. Do we believe that God has brought us to this place? Or do we believe that it's a random chance? But I think we know that God is in control of all things. Amen? God directs the hearts of kings. So do you think that your heart is exempt from God's direction, from God's control in your life? The answer is no. You're not here by accident. And it's important for us to know because again, the world is dealing with so much fighting and contention. But God created the body to be united. And so we are to strive for unity. Do you not know that in Jesus' priestly prayer in John 17, do you remember what he prayed? He said, he, he first prayed for the, 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 the 12 apostles. And then after that, he prayed for those that would follow after them, which includes us. And you know what, you remember what he prayed? He said, Father, I pray that they would be one, as you, Father, and I are one. Have you thought about that? The unity of God the Father and God the Son is divine. How could Jesus pray that we be united? I'm a knucklehead. I like to sometimes do my own thing and march to my own beat. But Jesus prayed that we would be one like they are one. How, is that, how can that happen? That can only happen as we submit ourselves to the Word of God. As, as all of us submit ourselves to the Word of God, then the oneness that comes through the Spirit of God, through His Word, unites us together. And Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, he pleads with the Corinthian church, and by extension us, that we would be united in thought, that we would speak the same thing, that we would have the same judgment. Paul echoes the prayer of Jesus that we are to be united. And Corinthians is not the only place where Paul mentions that. Philippians and a couple of other places, he talks about the importance of being united. And so we need to look, work to be united. How can we be united? Again, it's through God's word that we find unity. It's not, it's not from, well, I've been a Christian the longest of everybody in this room, so we're all united by me, behind me. It's not that. 
we become united through God's word. Amen? Amen. The other amazing thing that God bringing us together in unity, God saving us, right, by his grace, that we who were enemies of God, who were blasphemers, who were sinners of the worst sort, God showed grace upon us and saved us and sanctified us and purified us and adopted us and redeemed us. God has given us great value. Do you know that we are the only creatures that get to be saved from our corruption? My dog Snowball, he doesn't get to be saved. Fallen angels, they don't get to be saved. We get to be saved and adopted and redeemed. We are of great value. The Bible says, look at the birds of the air and the flowers of the field. He says, you are of greater value than they. And so as we recognize, and I'll ask you, do you recognize the value that God has placed upon your life? Do you recognize that? If there's any doubt about that, come talk to me after. You are of great value to God. So much so, John 3.16, right? That he sent his only begotten son to die for you while you were an enemy of God. While you were yet a sinner from God, God didn't say, you shape up, then we'll talk. That's not what happened. Because we were of such great value to God, he saved us for those of us who put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so we are of great, great value to God. And we need to acknowledge that and we need to understand that and we need to remember that. And as we recognize that God has assigned great value to us, then as we look around, I would invite you to look around down the row at one another. We recognize that God has given each of us and assigned great value to each one of us. So often, the world, and sometimes we fall into the same trap, where we value people based on what they can do. Man, I really like that guy because he sings good. Or I really like that guy because he pays for my lunch. Or, he, or I really like this guy because of what he does for me. And that's how we establish people, people's value. But do you recognize that if God has valued you, a sinner, then he values the person next to you. And so the way I judge my brother is not, what he, is not because of what he does for me, but because God has assigned value to him. Does that make sense? We need to look at that because that's what's going to also bring us together. When I look at any, anybody that I look at, I need to understand this is a child of God just as I'm a child of God. So I don't get to say, oh, that guy's kind of, you know, I mean, he's, yeah, I guess he's a Christian, but I like these guys over here. We don't, we don't have the freedom to do that. Especially when we recognize that the great value he has given, put on my life, is the, the great value that he's put on other people's lives. And so we are to look at each other and see each other's value, not based on what people's skills and gifts are, but on the fact that God has loved and saved people like that, <clears throat> our shared adoption in Christ. We must acknowledge and understand that our victories, our struggles, our circumstances, and our actions have direct consequences to the local body, body and affect one another. Because we are a body, because we are fashioned to be connected. When my head hurts, my whole body is affected. I've been diagnosed with vertigo. And so when I get vertigo, my whole body is messed up. I can't walk. I can't barely talk. I can't hardly do anything. Because, one of my, because my inner ear is affected, everything else is affected. And so in the same way, when we see each other's value, when we recognize that we are fashioned as a body, meant to be together, not to be separate individual parts, then we honor 
and rejoice with our brothers and sisters who have victory and, and who rejoice. And then we suffer and feel the hurt with our brothers and sisters that suffer pain and difficulty. As you heard Ruben talk about um, Hope Dominguez, um, who passed away. Her son Luke attends this church. Her daughter, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, her grandson Luke attends here. Her daughter-in-law uh, attends here. Um, you know, and so um, we should be at the very least praying for this family, even if we don't know them. Because they're, she was a part of the body. The family is part of the body. And so we are connected to them. And as they suffer, we are to suffer along with them. And we try to encourage them that we might in, be built up together through that shared affection and care for one another. And so again, <clears throat> I wanted us to begin by recognizing that God sovereignly in his divine authority and control and power fashions us together as a body in unity. Now if you can, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Starting at verse 11. <clears throat> we see kind of the, the next step from when we talk about God creating us as a body for unity. Verse 11 of chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians begins this way. And he himself gave... Some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, but in the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in the cunning crafti craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined in it together by what every joint supplies, according to the effect of working, by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. <clears throat> God didn't stop with fashioning a body from the individuals he saved and redeemed. God didn't just save us, fashion us together in a body and says, all right now, good luck guys. We'll see, we'll see you sometime in the future. He didn't stop there. He gave us gifts and offices. In uh, going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you don't have to turn there, but... Um, Continuing in the passage that we started in, in verse 27, it says, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. And then in Romans 12, 6 through 8, the scripture says this, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry. Let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And so again, he didn't just fashion us to be a body. But he also gave spiritual gifts and he gave offices to that body. As we read, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and all the other things that I mentioned. Why did he do this? As we continue to read and as we read in, in Ephesians, it becomes clear that the purpose is to be equipped 
and then edified or strengthened. Again, in verse 12, it says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. And he goes on to talk about all the other things that we would be edified or strengthened. He says that these gifts and offices were given so that we could come to the unity of the faith. And you can look in, in addition to this passage in chapter 4, you could look at John 17 and 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. I mentioned those earlier. So that we can grow in the knowledge of Christ, that our stature would be complete in Him, that we would become mature and stable in our doctrine. He said that we would not be like children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, that we should be able to withstand the deceitful plotting of ungodly people. And so we would understand our roles in the church in order to be built up and strengthened. This is why he gave these spiritual gifts and these offices. So that we would grow. So that we would be strengthened. So that we would be stable. That we would be able to withstand the, the attacks of those who are uh, uh, enemies of the cause of Christ. These are all the things that God has given us and the reason why he's given those things. How many of you are blessed by the teaching ministry? Oh, excuse me, sorry, I didn't finish. <laughs> You're like, I'm blessed. How many of you guys are blessed by the teaching ministry and the other things that Pastor Michael does here at the church? How many of you are blessed by the worship ministry led by Pastor Lito. Before the COVID thing happened, how many of you were blessed by the children's ministry led by the Mendiolas and by uh, you know, Javier and, uh, and, and his volunteers? And Angel, who, who does those as well. And we can just go down the list. The ushers who help with the parking and direct people to their seats and just all of those things. Are we not blessed? By all of those things, praise the Lord. And so as we exercise the spiritual gifts and the offices that God has set up and instructed us in his word, the body is blessed. The body is equipped. The body is strengthened. The body is, is strengthened. Amen? And so we see... Ephesians chapter 4, being lived out in our body. Praise the Lord for that. But all of these spiritual gifts that were given, do they exist only so that we can know the scriptures more? Are they just given so that we can have more ushers, more children's ministry workers, and more Bible teachers? Is that, I mean, that's, one of their purposes, I'm able to stand before you because starting in 1996, I came to this church and the church and the people in it helped me to grow in my faith. And so the spiritual gifts and the offices in this church helped someone like me and many of you to grow in our, in our walks and in our faith with Christ. But is that all that those spiritual gifts are for? Are they just to build up us in the church and create more Bible teachers and ushers and children's ministry workers? Now, don't get me wrong. We need those things and we need more of them. We're going to be opening up the children's ministry soon. We're going to need help with that. You know, we've, we've, I've seen some new ushers that have stepped up, but we've needed ushers. We need, you know, there's a lot of different things that we are in need of. And so we need those things. But again, is that, is that the only reason why we have these spiritual gifts? The answer is no. But look again with me in verse 12 of chapter 4. He says, He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Verse 12, it says, For the equipping of the saints, which, which we just talked about, for the work of ministry. We talked about some of the ministries in the church, but is there any other ministry that happens outside of the things that happen inside the four walls of the church? Yes or no? Yes. And so how are those things accomplished? 
How is the ministry outside of these four walls done? They are done with the same types of gifts that have been given to us inside the four walls of the church. Can you say amen to that? And it's something that we need to remember. The work of ministry in this context here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 is talking about the building up and the strengthening and the equipping of the body of Christ, the church. But I will ask you a question that I ask the men regularly. Why didn't God just take us to heaven immediately after we got converted? Once we got saved, why, why didn't we go to heaven right away? There's an answer for that. The answer is that because God established a church to accomplish something here on earth. If he had no plans for the church to accomplish anything on the earth, then why would we need to stay? We can go directly to heaven. We're saved. The sin issue has been dealt with. I'm ready for heaven. Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So let's just get on with it. But there's a reason. And the reason why God did not take us to heaven was not to go on vacation. Not to visit the Grand Canyon. Not to have kids and grandkids, even though those things are absolutely fine. That's not the purpose that he left us here. Why did God leave us here? Hopefully you're either thinking about that or say, oh, that's easy, I know why. He left us here because he has work for us to do. What is that work? Well, in Mark 16, 15, the Bible says, go into, uh, Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. One of the reasons why the minute we get saved, we don't go straight to heaven is because God has called us to preach the gospel. Can we say amen? We all, we all understand that, right? We are called to preach the gospel. The same gospel that saved us, God tells us that, that the gospel that saved us that was shared with us by someone, right? We are then called to turn around and share that same message with others that they might come to recognize their need for Messiah, that they would come to understand that they are sinners, that they cannot save themselves, and the issue of their sin will send them to hell. We are called to preach the gospel. In Matthew 28, 19 through 20, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. In addition to preaching the gospel, he says we are called to make disciples. To make learners. Not just to preach the gospel, but to spend time with people and help them in their understanding of God's word. And to teach them to observe all things that Christ has commanded us. That's another reason. In Matthew 5.16, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaking, he says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's another reason God left us here. That we might show, that we might shine, that we might reflect the light of God to the world that does not, that cannot see Him and who needs to see the light and He, and we, we can, they can see the light through our preaching and through discipling. But you know how else the Bible says we can see, they can see the light? By, as he says, shining our light through our good works. What are, what are our good works? Walking old ladies across the street? It's a good work. Praying for people? It's a good work. Is there more to do than that? Are there other good works that we can do that can shine the light of Christ that people would see it and glorify our Father in heaven? The answer is absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. Our strengthening and edification in the church that we talked about already is accomplished 
so that we can be Christ's representatives to the earth, that through our word and through our witness and through our work, that people would be reconciled to God. If you're taking notes, write 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. It's further support for what I'm just saying right now. We are built up, we are equipped, and we are strengthened as a church. But equipped for what purpose? Now, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, cause offense with anybody, but strictly speaking, we generally lift weights not just to look good. Now, some may say, well, <laughs> I do. As you can see, I do not. But we work out to equip ourselves for the work that we need to do. We, we get equipped for a specific purpose. And so in the same way, we the church are built up and equipped for a purpose. To preach the gospel, to make disciples, and to let the light of Christ shine before men. That they would see, not us, but would see the Father through the good works that we do. Amen? Our amens are getting quieter. <laughs> I, am, I encourage you. No, I stand up here and I, we, we, you know, preachers say, can I say amen? Because we're trying to see, we're trying to gauge if you guys are tracking with us. I hope I'm not confusing anybody. But I encourage you to even now be thinking about what is being said. Is that right? Are we equipped for a purpose? Think about that. And what purpose is that? Is it just to come to church Wednesday and Sunday? Is it just to help people to their cars and check people's temperatures as they walk in the church? Or to tell, teach Bible lessons to our kids? Is that, is that our purpose? Or along with those purposes, are there other things that we are called to do? That's what we need to think about. And I'm encouraging you to think about that. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. I was just talking about Matthew chapter 5 a little bit. I was talking specifically about verse 16. But let's back up a couple verses to verse 13. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Jesus speaking. And he says this, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Is it then good it is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men verse 14 You are the light of the world a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven Based on these verses, we are called to bring flavor and to shine God's light. And it's interesting. Jesus, he's very, he's very clear about this. He says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Very clear. There's no argument there. And so we need to Think about that, and we need to think about, well, what is the salt of the earth? What is the light of the world? And there can be a lot of kind of, you know, long answers that we can give to this, but just briefly, succinctly, if I can say, salt brings flavor, and it preserves. But we are called to bring God's flavor to the world. What, what, what's God's flavor? It's not wickedness, right? What is God's flavor? His holiness, his righteousness, and its truth. 
Because is there holiness and righteousness and truth apart from God? There isn't. Is there righteousness apart from God? I mean, just look at our, look at our world. Look at what's going on by those who reject God. There's no righteousness. Even when they call it righteousness, it's not righteousness. People are calling for justice. But the justice they are asking for is very selfish. It's very narrow. It's when we understand who God is that we understand holiness and righteousness and truth and justice. I've been arguing about, you know, so many things, but a lot of my arguing was, uh, was not talking about God. And I realized I was wrong. I can't talk about truth apart, apart from God. I can't talk about justice apart from God. Because how the world is talking about justice right now is not necessarily what the Bible is talking about when it talks about justice. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but it's, it's pretty evident. It's pretty evident. And we are the salt of the earth. We are called to bring the flavor of God to the world. They need to taste godliness as they experience us. Do they taste that as we walk through our lives in Christ? Does the world taste the flavor of the Messiah in our lives? Are, 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 are we, like Romans 12, 2 says, are we conformed to this world? Are we so much like the world that they can't taste anything but itself? They can't taste godliness. They can't taste holiness and righteousness. What is it for us? What is it for you? What is it for me? But Jesus says we are the salt of the earth. We're not supposed to taste like the world. We're supposed to taste like who we belong to. We are children of God. Amen? And so we are supposed to taste like that. And so when you put salt on something, you're transferring it from the little bottle onto the meat or whatever you're salting. And so that taste now is brought out. And so in the same way, we are to bring out the flavor of God through the work, the word, and the witness of our lives. And he says that we also are the light of of the world. What is the light of God that we are to shine His presence, His love, and His grace? I'm on Facebook, just so you don't think I just spend my, my, my life just looking at memes on Facebook. I have a ministry on Facebook. And so on one, uh, so what I see is a lack of God's presence when I talk to people on Facebook about stuff. They talk about so many things. They talk about karma. They talk about all kinds of wickedness. They talk about all kinds of stuff. And when you talk about God, you know what happens? They shut you off. They want to have nothing to do with you. Because the Bible says men love darkness rather than light. But we are called to be the light of the world. We are to reflect the light of Christ in the darkness. We are to shine God's presence. Does not the, Lord, the, the Holy Spirit live inside of us? You've got to say amen to that. Pastor Michael asked you that on Sunday. The Holy Spirit resides in us. Does not the love of God, was that not transferred to us? Do we not know the love of God in our life almost every moment of every day? Amen. And are we not, is not, we are the two great commandments of which, upon which the whole law, uh, um, the Old Testament law and the prophets are love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, right? So we are to shine love to the world. God's presence and God's love and his grace. The favor that is available to those by God. The grace of God through his son, Jesus Christ. So we are to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. So that in verse 16 it says, we would shine 
and show that flavor that people would see our good work and glorify our Father. They would be made aware of God and glorify Him through our actions because we are Christ's representatives here on earth. And we are equipped to do that in the church, united together with the gifts and the offices that God has given us. Amen. Along with the preaching, along with preaching the reality of, of the sin of man and the need for Messiah for forgiveness, salvation, and redemption, there is a need for God's nature and character to be revealed. I would invite you to look at me, look with me in the following passages. I already uh, in Matthew chapter four. Turn a, a page or two over. In Matthew chapter four, I want you to see something. In chapter 1, I mean in verse 1, excuse me, of chapter 4, it says, And Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And so we know the story, right? Jesus is starting his ministry and he's taken up to the wilderness that's tempted by the devil. I mean, you can, and most of us know the story. If you don't, you can read uh, the next several verses. But if you jump down to verse 17, shortly after the, his 40-day his and 40-night trial in the wilderness... He says this, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent. What's the next thing he says? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He says, the kingdom of God is before you. In Luke, he says something very similar. They said, when is the kingdom going to come? And Jesus said, the kingdom is within, uh, among you right now. He's speaking of himself. And so now where is Christ? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Amen? Is, is Jesus Christ right now the King of kings and Lord of lords? Amen. And so the kingdom of God exists in Christ. And guess who we are? The body of who? Christ. We are the representation, the representative of God's kingdom here on earth. God is going to establish his reign but God is king now, and we are citizens of his kingdom right now. Amen? Amen. And so, we need to represent and present that kingdom, which is Christ. Which is Christ. If you turn to Isaiah chapter 9... We're going to be reading this more, more specifically when Pastor Michael gets there in a couple of weeks. But in Isaiah chapter 9, starting at verse 6, it's a series of verses that all of us are very, or almost all of us, are very familiar with. We recite it almost every year. In verse 6 it says of Isaiah chapter 9, you remember what Pastor Michael said, right? You open your Bible up to the middle of the book, you're in Isaiah. So Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us, almost can say it by, by heart, a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government, government will be on his, upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Look at verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon, his th upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment or righteousness and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. I read to you Matthew chapter 4 to highlight that the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God, is Christ. It was revealed when Christ revealed himself, and we as his body are the representatives of that kingdom here on earth. And God's kingdom is established on righteousness and justice. And so as we think about our responsibility to shine our light before men, to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, part of that responsibility is to reflect the foundation of God's kingdom, which is God's righteousness and justice. And what is God's righteousness and justice? Read the scriptures. Pay attention as we go through God's word and you will see 
what justice is. But let me give you a quick little look at that. Isaiah chapter 1. I go here because Pastor Michael just taught on this not, not very long ago. So this should be a reminder for many of us. Remember in Isaiah chapter 1, the people of the southern kingdom were offering worship to God and God was not pleased with it. And so, in response to their, their, their worship that he was not receiving, he was not pleased with, he says in verse 16, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings and from before my eyes. Listen to this. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the, uh, plead for the widow. Now if there are any in here that are doing evil, we can look at the scriptures and we can hear what it says. Cease to do it. But then look what it says in verse 17. Learn to do good. Isn't that what Matthew 5, 16 says? He says, seek justice. What justice? Justice that the Bible teaches. Rebuke the oppressor. Stand against those that would oppress others. Defend the fatherless. The orphan. Those abandoned. And plead for the widow. These are the things that, instead of giving me worship that is not pleasing... Stop doing that. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. These connect very intimately with Matthew chapter 5. That our responsibility to the world is to be salt, to be light, and to shine through our good works is seeking biblical justice, godly justice, rebuking the oppressor, defending the fatherless, and pleading the widow. Are those good works? Yes. Do they reflect the nature of character of God if we do them? Yes. Because by God commanding them to do that, he's revealing his heart for his people. He wants his people to seek justice, to do good, to rebuke the, rep the oppressor, Defend the fatherless and to plead for the widow. He's revealing his heart to his people. This is what I want from you, but you're giving me uh, uh, you know, sinful worship. Stop doing that and do this instead. Imagine. Imagine. That if we stand at the forefront of our communities with this mindset, how people will be attracted to and confronted by the God that brings true meaning, value, and redemption to the world. Imagine if we stood up, if we did good, if we did those other things that it talked about in Matthew 5 and Isaiah chapter 9 and chapter 1. How people would take notice of that. It's been said that the church has lost a lot of its influence in the world. And I think that's true. Why is that? Is it perhaps because we like the salt have lost its flavor? That they're not seeing the God of the Bible in the way that we live our lives? Is it Perhaps because the light we shine is not the light that is mentioned here in Isaiah chapter 1, but it's something else. It's something for us to consider and to be honest with ourselves about as individuals and as a church. And if you would examine yourself and say, nope, I'm doing exactly what I need to do and I'm doing all of that, well then praise the Lord. And ultimately, you give an account before God. But I think for some of us, I dare say many of us, if we do an honest examination, we'll see 
that perhaps we're not quite up, quite up to where perhaps we should be in our responsibility to the world. So how do we accomplish being the salt and light to the world that God has called us to be? Well, preaching the gospel and making disciples is the primary way that we can engage our culture and reveal the truth of God and humanity to them. So we've got to know the Bible. We've got we to gotta grow in, our, in the grace and knowledge of God to be able to communicate the gospel and to make disciples for those who would, would, would want to be discipled. Voting, right? Election is coming up and we see a lot of effort in every community, but it's even in the Christian community to vote. Amen? We know, we know how important it is. Voting is a valid, but it's a passive way to promote and advance the kingdom of God. All right? We vote for people and then we hope that they do what we voted them to do. So it's something that we do, but it's a passive thing. It's valid. It's something we should do, but it's a passive thing. Missions giving. We collect the missions offering every, every month. Uh, Ruben, I think last week, uh, talked about the different missions that we support and that we have done in the past. But missions giving is a very good way to support active uh, um, promotion and advancement of the kingdom through the efforts of men and women in the field. But again, that giving is a passive act. Getting involved in missions work, like when we go down to Mexico and things like that, is a direct and active effort, but oftentimes carries an expense and a commitment that not everybody can afford. Pastor Michael has taken some to Cuba, but not everybody can afford to go to Cuba. So what else can we do? Well, firstly, we need to be in prayer on this issue and, and seek God's direction. Just as, I mean, God is in control of all things. And as we seek the Lord and His will, I don't think God says, oh, I have a will for you, but I'm not going to communicate that to you. I'm going to be mysterious. I don't, I don't think that's the heart of God. So we need to pray and seek His direction. Secondly, many of us are consumers of current events, right? We, we watch the news. We, we're on our different social media things. So we, we know what's going on. And we see the ideals and the ideas in this country and the radicalization of, of how things are going. And what we can do is we can search the scriptures to provide a counterpoint to that. Instead of just cheering the person we see online going, yeah, that's good, you tell them. Why don't we be the ones that tell them? But biblically, through the scriptures, that we would show the nature and character of God through the words that we speak as we give God's word and God's perspective on things. And when we do so, when we do so with biblical truth, some people will just get more angry. But some people, as the scripture says, their mouths will be shut because they can say nothing. I have a person that I regularly communicate with and they were talking about how bad Republicans are and how great Democrats are and because of this and because of that and because of this and because of that. And I said, well, I can't vote for this person because they're for abortion. And he stopped and he goes, point on you. Uh, that wasn't because I was so clever. The Bible says that abortion is, well, abortion is the killing of a baby. Amen? And... The Bible seems to teach pretty clearly that killing is not really something that's what we're supposed to be about. And so I said it, I stood for it, and he couldn't say anything because he couldn't. And so there are, there are answers and counterpoints that we can give, again, as we recognize our responsibility to be the salt and the light, and to shine and reflect the goodness, the truth, the love, the grace, the holiness, and the righteousness of God. It, 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 
tells us what we can do. As I close, I just want to share because it's something that I'm dealing with, on a, you know, personally. Um, you know, through this study, I've been studying and, and thinking about this for a long time. Um, I've come to, you know, I came to realize that, and I've, I mean, I've known about it for years, but I just never really think about, thought about it very often, about less than a mile from my house, there's a Planned Parenthood. And do you know that since Roe v. Wade was made into law, the number is around 60 million babies have died since then? 60 million. That's not even counting the Plan B pill. You know what that is, right? You think you're pregnant and you take it, and if you're pregnant, for, for the most part, you know, it kills the newly developed baby. And this is only one issue of many that we can talk about, but 60 million people, 60 million image bearers of God that have died. Can we not stand up to that? What kind of heart and mindset turns a, turns a blind eye to that? Where am I that I've spent so many years just driving by that place and barely letting it affect me in any way, shape, or form? If I'm called to be the salt and the light of God, the representative of God and his kingdom here on earth, how can I do that? How can we who sees the wickedness and all, whatever, whatever issue we want to talk about going on, how can we just let it go by with nothing? We need to come before the Lord and we need to seek his direction. We need to come to the Lord and recognize, do I have a responsibility to the world as a Christian? Do we as a church have a responsibility to the world? I would encourage you to look over these scriptures, meditate on what was said, Come before the Lord and allow him to direct you. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys.